Welcome back to another episode of Expats in Ukraine with your host, me, Corey. Uh, I'm super excited about my next guest. I'm a huge fan of his YouTube channel. Uh, he is a U.S. Marine. He's currently serving in the Ukrainian military as an FPV engineer in a drone unit. He has many names, Siv Div, but he prefers to be called Rody. What's up, yeah. man? Yeah, what's up, man? No, I'm super excited to have you on. I yeah, appreciate it. <laughs> no, huge fan. Like, you were probably one of the people that I had the most fun when I was researching. I was watching your videos, and I'm like, wow, I can't believe this is work. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I just love watching your videos, man. Yeah, I appreciate it, dude. Yeah, so yeah, uh, I'm sure you've seen this uh, podcast before, right? An episode before? Absolutely. Okay, so you know how like this first part goes, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, you ready? <laughs> so it's basically an icebreaker just so we can understand who the real roadie is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay, you're dig deep. <laughs> dig deep, questions. exactly. These are like some very insightful <laughs> questions here. So this or that. So, um, McDonald's in the U.S. or McDonald's in Ukraine? Ukraine. Yeah. Ukraine? What 100%. makes it special, man? People always ask me this, like, is the McDonald's bad in the U.S.? Is it better in Ukraine? It's the technology. Like, they, they have all the self-help booths like, yeah. everywhere. Everything's touchscreen. It's fast. Food's good. Huh? Yeah. I noticed this yeah. as well. Like, uh, I haven't been in the U.S. in years, but you've probably been back, you know, more recent than I have. Mm, but there's yeah. QR codes, like, in every restaurant here in Ukraine. I think we were talking about this yesterday, That right? too, yeah. yeah. On the tables, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't think in McDonald's, you just pay up front, but... Uh, yeah, that's whack. All, yeah, the, all yeah. the QR codes, dude. QR codes everywhere. Yeah, I have like some friends that are always complaining. I want menus. I hate these QR codes. I'm like, okay, boomer. <laughs> yeah, boomer. <laughs> okay, boomer. Yeah, we're saying that yesterday. It was funny. <laughs> yeah, but okay. So next, uh, root beer or kvass? Kvass. Kvass. Yeah, okay, yeah. Whoa. yeah. I actually haven't had root beer in a long time, man. Yeah, yeah they don't sell it here. I was about to say, I don't think I've ever seen in Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I love root beer. And when I try to explain it to people, they're like, is it beer? Like, I'm like, no, it's, it's like, I guess it's like kvass. It's kind of like kvass, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. But I hate kvass. God, really? <laughs> yeah, I don't like it at you all, like man. like sweet? Yeah, I'd rather Fair just enough. drink beer, man. <laughs> okay, so um, next. I think we you uh, we were talking about this one before. Tim Hortons or Aroma Kava? Tim Hortons. Tim Hortons, oh, okay. Yeah. Timmy's. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, what do you usually get when you go to Timmy's? Uh, toasted bagel, cream cheese, plain bagel. And uh, what, are the, oh, what do they call them? I haven't been there in so long. The Frappuccinos, mm -hmm. they have a special name for it, but they're incredible I'll yeah buy, like, the large i'm just... from california we don't really have timmy's over there man it's yeah it's Canadian. a shame man yeah, it's, it's a shame, shame. <laughs> yeah, i'm missing out man yeah <laughs> okay so last one michigan or kiev no oh, man that's a tough one i'd say yeah kiev i haven't Kiev's. been back to michigan in a while i'm here yeah. so so what do you like about kiev then yeah i like the people i mean it was cool like we went out last night and it was like oh, yeah. every <laughs> every corner that we passed by it's always people that we know and it's Super fun. No, I tell people yeah. Kiev is like a big village, but last yeah. night was like super fun, man. Yeah, yeah it was super cool. <laughs> well, I had a lot of fun. Your friends were great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Same with yours. Yeah, yeah. No, it, was, yeah. Like, it was a lot of fun. We kind of like the worlds collided and it was great, man. Still. I had a lot of fun. So many stories that we can't talk about on camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but no, it was a lot of fun. So uh, yeah, tell me, what, what brought you to Ukraine? This is like the million dollar question. I'm sure you get asked this a lot, but what brought you to Ukraine? That was uh, right when the full scale invasion started. Um, I knew a lot of my friends that were coming. Uh, right at the beginning, so I was in that. I was in a oh, what would you call that? Like in between in my in my life, I, I could either go back home, which I was planning to, or to Ukraine, join my friends. Um, so yeah, I went with Ukraine. Yeah, it's not a bad place to be. Uh, mm -hmm. I really, honestly, when it comes to foreign fighters, I really respect what they're doing here, and especially you, man. You have this huge following, and. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of times when I'm watching your videos, I'm like, well, I'm so glad that, you know, he has this perspective. He has this huge, huge audience and he supports Ukraine and he's, you know, trying to uh, combat some of these Russian narratives that are out there. Because it was this guy, Nick Shirley, that came out, came around. Nick Shirley. Nick, oh, oh, yeah. That, this guy yeah. bought this video. Yeah. And he was just saying, oh, this is where your money's going. And he's like, shows nice cars and a Ferris wheel. Mm -hmm. And immediately I remembered your video when you're talking about, you know, war versus life in Ukraine. Yeah. And you're saying like, yeah, people need to unwind. It's hard to think about the war like 24 seven. People yeah. need to have a drink. People need to go walk around with their friends, have some dinner, yeah. you know? And you were saying, you know, all the wars you fought in, um, yeah, it was, it's, you need to take a break from it sometimes Absolutely, because yeah. you'll go crazy, you know, go mental. Of course, yeah. You can't blame people for having a good time or the economy is still running, you know? Like people yeah. are gonna buy what they want, you know, if they have the money. Like you can't blame people for having nice cars that they saved up a lot for, you know? Yeah, yeah. and it's, I don't know. It's it's just so sad because I I knew this guy got connected with him, this Nick mm. guy, and it was just you know really sad that he. I feel so used. You know, he came over here and tried to spin this narrative mm. about we're wasting money on Ukraine. I got so pissed off, man. You know, we we were also saying he's pretty young. You know, he's yeah. pretty young, and I, I remember myself that age, and yeah, you know, young people. I I know I've done a lot of silly things or questionable <laughs> things at that point. So it seems like he's going to reflect on it, and I'm sure it'll be good. Yeah, I hope so, yeah. man. I really hope so because. 
Yeah, so a lot of people don't yeah. understand. It's not, it's not a game, man. People are dying. It's true. You know, and with, with the lack of support from the West, more people could die. And if yeah. you're creating these Russian propaganda videos, whether you're a useful idiot or getting paid, you yeah. know, you're potentially putting people's lives in danger. It's true. Yeah, and yeah. it's, it's not a game. This is, yeah, what I want to get out. Yeah. Uh, but okay, so um, before we get into like what you're doing in Ukraine exactly, yes. yeah, let's talk about uh, your life in the U.S. What were you doing in Michigan or in the U.S.? Um, well, last time I worked there was many years ago. Like seven years ago or something, I worked at Apple. Apple, okay. Uh, Apple retail, like the then, fruits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just like that. I worked at Apple. Apple so. <laughs> but uh, I worked there for uh, for a year. Pretty pretty nice. But I knew I wanted to go back, so uh, I went to Syria at that point, YPG, and then uh, pretty much the last time I've been to Michigan, it's always been van life. So van living life. in a van that I built, this van home. Oh, you told so, me about this before when we were hanging out yesterday. You yeah. were saying that you were in California in your van, right? Yeah, yeah. And you said it's like really hard to, to park in LA. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I like going to like the deserty areas and the mountainous areas where it's away from everybody. A little bit easier to find parking. Yeah, but I'm super yeah. interested in this. Tell me about your van life. Why did you start doing this? You come everywhere in the US or where have you been? Yeah, and it well, it's actually pretty funny as well. This was the a lot of people forget this. This was the the big moment for me on YouTube at the start when I when I started six, seven years ago. I was building this van and I did a van tour and that was like kind of the start of my channel. Yeah. Um, well. But the, yeah, the whole reason I did it was uh, I was in the YPG uh, in Syria. Just gotten. What year off, was this? Uh, 2018, 2019. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I ended up uh, just thinking up a, a van build. I, I knew that I wanted to do something a little weird mm -hmm. after the YPG. You know, I didn't want to just work at retail again. Yeah. I was kind of losing my mind. So. So you went through like your training in the U.S., right? Uh, for the Marine Corps, or? for the van train, van life, <laughs> no, oh, for, for the Marine Corps, yeah, no, Marine, no, there's Marine. no training. No, I'm joking. Marine life. Oh, like, Marine, Marine life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Training yeah, yeah. For, build a van. <laughs> California is uh, it was uh, 29 Palms. You know where that is? Uh, Palm Springs or Ju yeah, oh, exactly. Springs. Okay, like 40 minutes away from it. Yeah. Okay, right on. Yeah. So, uh, what made you decide to join the military? Are you just started right out of high school or something? You know, I, I thought it. Yeah, I was right out of high school. I thought about this question a lot, and as I've grown grown older, I think that it had a lot to do with patriotism. Um, but I think a big reason was egotistical reasons, you know, like mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to go back home, be like, Oh, I'm a Marine. It was kind of like, a, I was, I put my identity into it. So that way I could erase the old me and like become, that was kind of the reason I think it's uh, for a lot of young men who join the military to mm -hmm. sort of restart and be like, I am now a Marine. Like, yeah, no, a lot of people don't know. So. Uh, there's like, a lot of patriotism in the U.S. Uh, I yep. think this is funny now looking back on it. But mm. when you were a kid uh, growing up, at least when I was a kid, at the beginning of our school, like, uh, you know, from elementary school, we would have to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you yeah. do that as well, of right? Of course, yeah. <laughs> no, it's like so strange because I tell people this. They're like, Are you, they're just indoctrinating you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I pledge allegiance to the flag. <laughs> and I remember on my last hour as well, like the, the last hour of the day, like, yeah, we do the Pledge of Allegiance. And then like, the entire day they had the TV on. It was just like Marine ads, like ads for because they knew we were seniors and about to go. Yeah, yeah. You know, and they would put up like Marine ads and you know, that was a big thing as well. I was I felt special where the class knew that I was joining the Marines because I was very like open about it. I see the ads, I'm like, Yeah, that's gonna be me, you know. Yeah. Was, uh, no, I was I mean, already erasing my identity, I was just going straight to military. Yeah. Yeah, in high school, we had these like tables set up, you know, towards the end of like senior year. And yeah. then they would uh, try to get people to join the military or something like this. Yeah. But I remember I talked to one of the recruiters. I was young and I talked to one of the recruiters because I didn't understand like I wanted to know more about it, maybe. Mm. And she was constantly calling me. She would show up to my house at random hours like it's Corey here. Oh, yeah, maybe we can have a talk. I can take you to like this base or something like this. And I was like, wow, super it's aggressive. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, tell her I'm not home. <laughs> I, I did. I did a uh, recruitment. Yeah. Like you, you can do that after boot camp as well. Mm -hmm. Extend the amount of days that you have in between, like going to your next training base. Yeah. So I, I actually did that. I went to a high school. It was um, they had a mass shooting. It was all over the news. Oxford, Oxford, oh, wow. Oxford, Michigan. Um, but yeah, that's where I did the like many years ago, a little recruitment duty. Went to the lunch, uh, the lunch room, and yeah. we could try to recruit people, capturing kids, yep. taking capturing them kids. back to the base. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's cool. So, um, all right. So, you, how long were you were you in the military in the U.S.? Uh, it was only two years. Two years, okay. Yep. And how was how was boot camp like? Uh, boot camp was for myself. It was really difficult. Uh, didn't cause any problems. Um, by the end of the training. The drill instructors didn't even know my name. Like I was that like under the radar, but it was a uh, pretty rough for me. You know, I didn't like the hiking. Um, I found the the physical stuff to be pretty tough, except for the running. Uh, but the the big heavy lifting stuff. I'm a small dude. I'm a small <laughs> dude. It, it, 
Not very easy. No. You got some arms on you, man. Yeah, no. <laughs> but when, yeah, they don't feed you over there, you know what I mean? I got out and I weighed uh, 116 pounds. 116, wow. 116. I'm like 135 now and I'm still, you know. Wow, I was 135 my senior year of high school. Yeah? Yeah, wow. 135, yeah. Pretty thin. Yeah, it was really thin, man. Yeah, we but, put on we put on some meat, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but mostly uh, in the stomach. <laughs> but um, but yeah, okay. So tell me, you were in you were a U.S. Marine two yeah. years, then you'd van life. Yeah, and then you joined the YPG. It was uh, YPG just before? Yeah. Oh, just before. Okay, yeah. so how did you join the YPG? Why did you join the YPG? Yeah. yeah. Um. So. I'll explain what YPG is first, like for people that of course, don't know. Yeah. yeah, it's a Kurdish group. Uh, there's a lot of foreign fighters here in Ukraine that are. Uh, that have experience in Syria with the YPG. And it's a Kurdish group. They're, they have a very similar fight to the Ukrainians right now, fighting for their independence, fighting for their language, their culture. Um, and yeah, I, I joined them. Um, I started contacting in 2018 and I knew I didn't want to do retail. I felt a little, a little bad about my Marine Corps experience. I had gotten out early. I had to add separate, uh, Ad sep, administrative separation. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, <clears throat> wasn't the best terms. I wanted to sort of remake myself. And uh, so I contacted them. Uh, they said to fly over to Iraq. And then I, I did. So you just fly to Iraq? You, just, Iraq? you could just fly to Iraq. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that until uh, <laughs> you told me to. And then went to the YPG, got smuggled across to Syria. Um, wow. Yeah. Well, so uh, yeah, I saw your videos and you were saying you weren't like in a combat role, right? Uh, in the YPG, I was, yeah, I didn't see combat. Mm -hmm. We were in combat role, though. Oh, yeah. combat role, sorry. But you didn't yeah. see combat is no. what I meant, so, yeah. Not at all. There okay. was stuff that would happen. Like, ISIS tried to burn down our base. It got really close to it. Oh, wow. Uh, they burned down partially uh, the base next to us, the woman fighter's base. Mm -hmm. So stuff happened, but no combat. Didn't shoot my rifle at all. Oh, wow. Yeah. So um, a lot of people, I noticed that there's a lot of people that were in the YPG are mm -hmm. in the Ukrainian military, like, you know, Sean Pinner, maybe Aiden Aslan was YPG. Yeah. And even Troy, but he was Perishmerga or yeah. something like this. But do you know the difference, like the, the difference, uh, like so Perishmerga and YPG, why do they, uh, why are they conflicting each other with each other? Yeah. You know, it's all politics. Oh, yeah. um, you know, it's Kurds, it, kind of like how we have different political parties, mm -hmm. same thing. But the problem is that the political parties have their own military. Yeah. Right. So there's always going to be butting of heads and. They're not in an active conflict with each other. They just heavily disagree with who their allies should be, what direction forward the Kurdish movement should be. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it, you know. Okay, and Kurdistan is basically on the corners of, you know, Turkey, um, Iran, Iraq, and Syria, right? It's yep. like in that. Yep. Okay, and the Perishmerga and the YPG are on the same territory, or they're like, one is like in Syria, one is in Iran, and or what is in... Yeah, yeah, Turkey, what, how does it work? It, it's a very complicated yeah. uh, thing. The YPG is specifically just the Syrian Kurds. Oh, okay. okay? Um, but, you know, I, after the YPG, I did the YBS, which was in Iraq, mm -hmm. and Peshmerga is all in Iraq. Yeah. So um, that's where we mostly butted heads was when I was in the YBS in Iraq, and Peshmerga like, what the heck? Yeah. You know? And so... Uh, very complicated stuff. And so. you joined the Ukrainian military right after your, experience, your time in uh, Middle East, right? Yep. Yeah, right okay. after Iraq. So yep. two separate occasions and then 13 months in Iraq, <clears throat> living in tunnels, you know, mm -hmm. I've been tunnels. public about it on my, on my YouTube. And, um, yeah, as soon as I left, I was at the airport and I had, was like just about to, the next day I would buy a plane ticket back home mm -hmm. and then the full scale invasion happened. What, what is so. something that you learned from your experience in the YPG? Oh man, learned a lot. Uh, learned a lot about myself as well. Um, I would say like personally, became a lot more introspective. I, I started to understand why I was doing the things I did. So, you know, I was speaking about the Marine Corps earlier, and mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot of the reasons that drove me to Syria were personal egotistical reasons. Um, and I like talking about this topic because there's a lot of foreign fighters who, who are joining Ukraine. I, I don't mm -hmm. think they really think deeply about it sometimes. Um, so, yeah, you're asking why I joined YPG? Uh, yeah, so like, what was your experience like? You know, why, why did you join? What motivates you to be in the YPG? Because you're not yeah. related to the Kurds at all, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I joined the YPG, you know, for a lot of the, um, the reasons that, uh, that I said before. It was also we were fighting ISIS. Yeah. Everybody knew that they should be gone, so I wanted to help out. I knew I had training, you know, from the Marine Corps. And the reason that I joined the YBS about mm. two years afterwards um, was completely for the Kurds. I mm -hmm. took away my phone, didn't do YouTube, anything. I stuck with learning the Kurdish language. I, I'm now like 
Kurdish pretty much language, fluent. Wow. Yeah, pretty much fluent in it's not even Kurmanji or Sarani, which are the two main dialects. It's the yeah. specific one in Shengal, but uh, I just became like completely um, immersed, immersed, yeah. immersed, and that, that was the big that was the plan. To like, what made it so special for you? Man, it was special. Yeah, it's it was the best time of my life. It really was mm. special. It was it was interacting with the Kurds, being with them, living among them, learning the language, just being completely immersed in the culture, mm. staying away from like my own wants and needs. I want to, you know, I want to go in operation. I want to do this, but just doing the work, digging the tunnels, mm -hmm. living in there, defending your position. Uh, just incredible. Best time of my life. It's, seriously. It sounds like a very spiritual kind of thing that you were going through. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but I imagine you had trouble when you came back to the U S though. No, no, no. Uh, surprisingly cool. not. No. Uh, well, I know that after the YPG, uh, a little bit, not trouble, not okay. trouble. Uh, just questions, questions. Okay. Yeah. But, um, before before Iraq, that was had a little bit of trouble, but not not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah, because I remember yeah. I think I was talking to Sean or Aiden or something, and they were yeah. saying they had a lot of trouble when they went back to the UK. <laughs> yeah, well, they're from the UK. The US yeah. is uh, very lax with it. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, and so uh, you were there for how long? Uh, Syria was seven months. Mm -hmm. It was a six month contract. Okay. And then Iraq was thirteen months with a eight month contract. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, uh, and then after that, you came to Ukraine, right? Yep. Just immediately after? Yeah, immediately after. Flew okay. from Iraq to Poland. Yeah. Okay. Why, why did you come to Ukraine? Yeah. Uh, so, again, the reasons were I had my buddies uh, that I knew from the YPG, YBS, even Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. um, and they were all heading over there. And I, I knew that, you know, I, I didn't want to leave them, leave them behind. You know, this is a war that's happening right there. It's people that I really care about. And... I knew that Aiden Aslan, I knew that Sean Pinner, a lot of these people that I know were ideologically somewhat the same were in this fight. They had been here, been in Ukraine for years, even prior to the full-scale invasion. Mm -hmm. So I knew that it'd be a good fight. And um, I've been in Ukraine for a year and a half now, total. And So uh, what, what month did you arrive? Uh, it was March. Um, I think I arrived in country in Ukraine March 7th, oh, 2022. Wow. Yeah. It's like right after the invasion? Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy, man. And so... Um, <clears throat> what was it like? Uh, like, actually, what did you hear about Ukraine before you came? I'm super curious. Like stereotypes, maybe. Yeah, I mean, like I, I knew because I was very connected with my church growing up. Um, we had a couple. What do they call those? Missionaries, missionaries that were in, okay, in yeah. Ukraine. So I know that there was a lot of orphanages here. Um, I kind of heard like a lot of stuff that it was just an Eastern European country, but <laughs> it's so much more than that. They have their own culture and identity and language, and it's it's uh. Yeah, it's really, it's really freaking cool. So um, what was the process like? You just came to Poland and then you crossed into Ukraine by train? Uh, it was by bus at that point. But yeah, I met up uh, with about 20 other YPG and YBS veterans mm -hmm. and we all linked up in Poland and then we all crossed together in a bus. Okay, uh, and they don't question you when you're coming in? Or? Well, they question, they question. Yeah, okay. Not so much at the start. Um, I think now it's a little bit more stringent to try yeah. to figure out who's coming in, but yeah, there's still questions. Uh, Okay, so you, you came to Ukraine, and what was like the, the first thing that you noticed? You know, what, is, what was your impression of Ukraine when you first came? I mean, the, the impression was that it is definitely a war going on. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like there's uh, big lines of like kilometers long, 40 kilometers long, I think, mm -hmm. of just vehicles trying to get out of the country, uh, but also a lot of people trying to get in. Um, mm -hmm. First impression, it was in Poland mm -hmm. when I arrived there, when there's this huge influx of families like, that the, the soldiers' families were sending them out of the country because they thought it was going to fall pretty quick, oh, you know? Wow. And, like, being in Poland where everybody, all the Polish people were so supportive of everybody. They were filling up the hostels full of people, free coffee, free everything. Um, the world really, like, out there, it was so together. You, you, you were here during the invasion. Oh, uh, yeah, I was actually in western Ukraine. So yeah. um, I was in Kiev, and then my friend said, like, hey, uh, they're starting to evacuate people from the U.S. Embassy. Yeah. Maybe you should consider, like, leaving as well because my friends were going to leave. And my ex-girlfriend, she was from uh, Mukachevo, which is this Western Ukrainian city okay. near the border of uh, Hungary and Slovakia. Oh, so okay. I was like, okay, let's go with your parents, uh, and then we'll just be there. And if they invade, uh, then maybe we'll go to Europe or we'll stay in Western Ukraine. And if they don't, then we'll just come back to Kiev. And they invaded, like, next week. Cool. So then I was, like, in Mukachevo for, like, four months before we ended up leaving the country. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, you'd stay here for quite a long time about nine years now so yeah exactly I bet, I bet you knew like what to what to do in that situation which is good oh yeah and it was great because you know she was from 
literally like the most western city like in ukraine yeah. right next to the border so I'm like, okay i feel safe here like <laughs> just it, go home <laughs> yeah even if they try to like shoot a rocket it's like if they missed by like maybe a kilometer two kilometers they're like hitting uh hungry or something like this there you go yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i felt like quite safe. safe i never heard an air alarm when i was there wow yeah so um I was watching the news every day, like both of her brothers were in the military. Wow. And I remember uh, a few days before, or a, a day after they invaded, he was like, okay, I have to go now. And then he left. And then the other brother, um, he was like, okay, I'm gonna go too. And so we walked him to like the base, like in Mukachevo. And it was super sad. Everyone's like, you know, bringing their, uh, the girls are bringing their, uh, their boyfriends, their husbands, uh, mothers bringing their sons and they're saying bye to them. And everyone's like crying. And yeah. it was a very sad, sad moments in my, ex-girlfriend was crying saying bye to her brother yeah oh uh, apparently they're both fine uh thank god but it was yeah it, it, like this is when the reality hit in for me yeah. like wow these people could be gone you know and they're risking their lives to save their country nobody knew what you know a month after the war started what the situation would be <clears throat> i know there's yeah big talks then pushing west and yeah for the soldiers at the beginning huge respect huge, yeah. especially the ukrainians huge respect for holding the line just staying there when Nobody knew what, what would happen. Yeah, you know I mean, yeah, yeah. and it's crazy. it's been like almost three years now, man. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. So, um, okay, so you came, you joined the military, you joined International Legion, or what'd you join? Yeah, no, I uh, never joined the Legion, mm -hmm. um, which a lot of people don't know, but yeah, never joined <laughs> the Legion. It was uh, we did a couple things at the start, uh, tried to get paperwork, so we went to Kiev. I went mm -hmm. to Kiev with two of my buddies. It was uh, and we were checking live map, trying to figure out like <laughs> because the Russians had went over that train. It was like nearly surrounded. They went over the yeah. train tracks. We were like refreshing, refreshing. And okay, Russians are out. And then we like crossed through in the train. Oh, well. And then uh, stayed for like two days. And then um, after that, we trained a territorial defense unit, which mm -hmm. is cool because I'm in one right now. Yeah. Um, trained them for like a day, but they were just sent straight to the front, you know. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I did my first mission in Ukraine uh, a week after that. Uh, down in Mykolaiv, uh, mm -hmm. back when the Russians were like really close there. Yeah. And... Yeah, that's kind of what we did at the first month or two. Yeah. Okay. And uh, which directions have you been like active in? Yeah. So after Meek Live, I ended oh. up joining uh, an SBU unit oh. uh, out in a Western area and spent a month there. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I went to uh, Kharkiv to go and Kharkiv. join up with one of my old Marine colleagues. Um, okay. So joined his unit. It's an SSO unit uh, back then. Mm. No, nothing crazy like SBU Alpha is. Uh, we actually found out when we were doing paperwork afterwards that it was a partisan group. <laughs> well, <laughs> partisan -esque. Yeah, but uh, we had joined them. We were doing a recce, um, mm -hmm. recce into the gray zone. Okay. Gray zone was a lot bigger back then. So Kharkiv. Kharkiv. All okay. the uh, museum. So you know uh, Ripka, right? We yeah, talked yeah. about her yesterday. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> no, she's amazing, man. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I was, she uh, was in Kharkiv as well. Uh, I think she's from Kharkiv. Yeah, of yeah. course. But I think she was there at the start as well. Yeah, because I think she was telling me that uh, her flat was in the, it became the gray, gray zone right away. Yep. Yeah, so she showed me the up. videos. Yeah, yeah, crazy. No, Ripka is, I don't know, I love watching her content. It's so cringy and <laughs> Gen Z humor, <laughs> <laughs> schizo. No, but I it's love it. Worse. Yeah, no, she's yeah. amazing. She's amazing. Yeah, she's cool. I met her in Lviv. Yeah, she's the one that gave me like uh, the nickname Ambassador Smetana, Smetana Ambassador. <laughs> 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 because I had that video about Smetana. I mean, gosh, no, she's hilarious. Yeah, I still uh, keep in touch with her. Yeah, I posted that photo yeah. with you uh, yesterday. She like liked it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. she's cool. A lot of yeah. cool people, especially in Kharkiv. I've actually never been to Kharkiv. What's what's the really? vibe like these days? You, it's, yeah, man, it's great. It's uh, like a smaller Kiev. Um, yeah, streets are full. People are walking around. A lot of air raids. A lot mm. of alarms and stuff. A lot of strikes, uh, especially the last like six months. But um, relatively safe, happy place. Yeah, yeah. I and like what, it. What would you say the differences are? Uh, you know, between your experience in the Middle East uh, and in Ukraine, what are the differences in war? Ooh, quite a few differences. Um, there is. Like, not as intense in Iraq and Syria, okay? Like, mm -hmm. obviously, I think everybody has uh, spoken about that who's been to the, to the yeah, Middle yeah. East. But when I look back at the experiences, I know that they were so different because we just had drones, like um, like big drones in Iraq and Syria, no fighting, that very little of it. But when I look at the numbers of people that were killed or injured in my platoon, both here in Ukraine and over there, it's the same. It's the same. Although the intensity was a lot lower over there, mm -hmm. every two weeks there would be a precision strike. And in that, two, three people would die. Like all my commanders in the YBS, dead. They're, they're all dead, you know. They're all martyred. Um, so the intensity was uh, very, very different, but it was just precision strike. And there's a lot more room for complacency. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, complacency like in Ukraine, there's no room for it. It's always like how many shells are being launched on the front line every every minute. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. There's no room for complacency. But over there, it's uh, after a couple of days after that precision strike, you'll kind of stay outside when a drone's above you and you'll kind of not go into the tunnels and, mm -hmm. and something will happen. I mean, you deal with like a lot of death around you. Like, for example, yesterday we went to uh, Maidan and you're, you yeah. put a flag down for your buddy Z Zaffer? Zaffer. Zaffer. Yeah, yeah. How do you yeah. deal with this, man? I, it was just sad watching you write his name on the flag, man. I almost teared. Oh. Yeah, yeah. How do you deal with it? Yeah. Um, for myself, you know, this is my fourth trip to Ukraine. I spent about six months each time, somewhere around there. And the whole reason I came out here was because of Ethan and Shresh, uh, two of my colleagues, um, good friends of mine. We were instructors together. Shresh was the other team leader in Iraq. Um, you know, they were, they were the reason that I'm back here again. And the way that I deal with uh, this sort of stuff is to come back and do the work, try and uh, make an impact in their name, in their honor. And it, it, keeps, it keeps me motivated, you know, mm -hmm. upstairs soldering the drones and stuff and get a little tedious and stuff. But I mean, I've got them on my phone right now. It's a, anytime I open my phone, they're right there. And it's uh, that's what motivates me. Mm. That's why I came back. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I was there with Troy. I think I told you before we were actually with yeah. Troy together, but this one time I went there with Troy cause I always pass by just like looking at the flags and reflecting on, yeah. you know, these brave people, especially people from my country that risked their lives and gave their life, you know, defend the Ukrainian cause. And I was there with Troy this one time, I think I told you already, but yeah, he was like, Oh, they put this guy's flag there. And I was like, how do you know this guy? And he told me the story, how he knows him. And he's like, oh, that guy, uh, I remember how we had to like re retrieve his body. Yeah. Uh, and he, I don't know, it's just so much emotion. Like Troy's not really an emotional guy, no. but I can just feel like the emotions coming from him, whether his face showed it or not. And, and he was like very upset, yeah. you know, cause these people didn't have to die. He's like, these people don't have to, these flags don't have to be here, mm. you know? And then I remember I was watching an interview with Sean Pinner. He was interviewed by Adam Kinzinger, Congressman. Yeah. And he was, and Sean was saying, uh, you know, when they were delaying the aid, there was a lot of like shell hunger, he was calling it. It's like our arty shells, artillery shells. And because of that, they couldn't stick, you know, fights back. And they were losing a lot of ground. And finally, the con uh, Congress passed this, uh, this bill to give aid to Ukraine like last winter, before the winter or something like this. And mm -hmm. it really helped. But a lot of people died because it was being delayed. You know, and it, it, maybe yeah. these American people died as well because of that, you know, indirectly. Yeah, it's I mean, we all, we all came to the fight. We... We knew that we were the underdog, you know what I mean? And I know that Zoffer, I know that Shrash and Ethan, they, they've all been underdogs before and they knew what was being asked of them. And I know that they completely believed in the fight to the death, obviously, mm -hmm. you know? And I think, um, yeah, there's time There's time for grief. Um, that was a great time yesterday. Mm -hmm. It was nice to, nice to go there to Maidan. Um, but I, I think we generally agree. It's, we all know what we're in the fight for. And if we're not here tomorrow, it's, Man, what better place to to lay your life? You know what I mean? And I see your bracelet too. Troy has a similar one. What does that yeah. represent? Yeah, this one, um, it's Denny Tran. Uh used to be black and white. I've worn it for like nine years now. Denny Tran, he was in my unit, died from a motorcycle accident, not mm -hmm. combat, um, in the Marine Corps. But it reminds me, you know, that, you know, at this point we could have 20 bracelets, but I keep the same one. Um Yeah. It kind of uh it's on the, the arm that I wear my tattoos as well, and just worn it for a long time. It's uh, it kind of represents for me everybody that's fallen, personally. Yeah, because yeah. Troy has one as well. It's like one of his buddies that died in combat. Yeah. And yeah, whenever I see this, I kind of I already understand what it is, whether you have to explain it or not. Like yeah. it's like someone that was close to you that died, and, and like yeah. you said, it's you could have like twenty or forty like at this point, man. It's yeah, it's really sad to hear. Is what it is, but. Yeah, tell, me, tell me about this uh, Zafra guy, because he was quite close to you, right? Because you wrote Meow yeah. on it, like an inside joke that you guys have or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell me about him. What was he like? He's an incredible dude. He was uh, also a Marine. Uh, he got out early as well, just like me. And um, incredible dude. He had uh, been injured and shot in Ukraine, in uh, Syria, in Iraq multiple times. He's done volunteer fighting for his entire life. And my first time meeting him was in Syria. He had just gotten off operation. He had a piece of shrapnel in his ass <laughs> and through his hand. Oh, wow. So I went to shake his right hand. And he's just got like gauze on him, yeah. he, fresh off the operation. He's like, oh, let's shake with the left mm -hmm. hand. You know, it was super funny. Never a dull moment with him. Super down to earth. Really, really cared about the people um, that he's with. And yeah, he's just an incredible dude, man. I, uh, actually, the only interview that I've ever put on my YouTube channel was mm -hmm. years ago 
it was a two-parter and it was of him because I, I wanted to i wanted to interview him he's got a really amazing story yeah. um so yeah what's no because uh, i remember we were talking about it yesterday and then troy was ex telling a story about someone that uh was close to him like in the military that died as well mm. and to me it's i don't know anybody that has died in this war fortunately i know like you know, friends of friends, maybe, yeah. but I had never met anyone that I was close with that died. And then when I hear the stories like from you right now and also from Troy, I don't know, it just breaks my heart, man. And the way you guys like, you laugh about it, like this experience you had with this person and then, cause they didn't have to die this soon, man. It's, it's all you can do. You know what I mean? No. Yeah. We all know what's asked of us. And um, the, the only reason I can, I could smile about the good times that I have with them is because they want that. But also that's, that's how they live their life. You know, like Zafra was always smiling, always, always happy Shresh Ethan like yeah we, we all know we all know what this job can bring you know mm -hmm. we're, we're not dumb about it and you know that as well yeah like, just being in Ukraine stuff can happen and I know I know that they want us to accept it you know what I mean yeah, yeah. Do, do you feel like you get numb to a lot of this sometimes because you deal with it so often sometimes kind of like dissociate maybe a little bit I know I know friends who do it a lot better mm -hmm. um when I'm in Ukraine, I feel a lot better because I can do something about it. I know that, you know, there's grief and stuff, but I can work myself into a place where I can, I can honor their name. I can make FPV drones. I can do something. Mm -hmm. uh, but as soon as I'm like not in Ukraine, a pretty hard time when people pass and there's nothing I can do. Yeah. You know I mean? So I remember watching one of your videos. Hmm. Um, and so you had, you were like in a foreign unit. I can imagine when you were in the YPG, right? A lot of foreigners like in your yeah. units, right? And then you were saying that because of ideology, uh, some of these people that were in your units, like in the YPG in Syria, hmm. they ended up fighting for Russia. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, not, not connected to the Kurdish cause, but yeah. a lot of them joined um, for specific reasons. And it was the people that I know that joined the Russians uh, were very, very, we were very close in Iraq. We got along very well. Uh, one of them was like a father figure to me. like like very, very close and it was in the YBS and uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of stories with him, but he ended up joining uh, the Russians and brought one of the younger dudes uh, with him. And it's sad. It's uh, a little bitter about it still, um, you know, bitter that they went to the wrong side, but mostly bitter because uh, the memories I have with them are stained. You know what I mean? I think they would think the same as me, uh, but just a very weird thing, man. And what was yeah. their ideology, ideology like? Because obviously it was different than yours if you decided to fight for Ukraine. It was very anti-NATO. Um, you know, I think it's, it's good to be critical of NATO, critical of, uh, you know, different groups that are, that are out there. But they were very, very critical to the point where they were militaristic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously in Iraq and Syria, uh, the Turkish government doesn't like us. Okay, so they're part of NATO, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. And... I think that was uh, part of the reason that they're they decided to join the Russians. They're like, God, like I don't want I don't want anything to do with NATO. And I, I disagree heavily. I think that NATO, for the large part, stands for good. Um, but there's just one country in there that stains a lot of people's minds, and and I'm joining the Russians. Yeah. yeah. And how did you find out? They told you one day that well, I'm going to join Russia, or mm -hmm. that you just found out on the news, maybe, or through a friend. Yeah, through a friend. Yeah, through mm -hmm. a friend. Uh, they also made some some news things, mm -hmm. and. Uh, crazy story uh, my buddy arnie mm -hmm. uh he i have some of his combat footage on my channel uh, from volodar about a year and a half ago and i was reading the article from that my buddy sent me of the guys who joined the russians mm -hmm. they were at the same time three kilometers away from arnie as arnie is doing drone drops on dudes but the difference is that arnie was doing drone drops he was doing his job as a, a drone pilot mm -hmm. these guys who joined the russians were part of a blocking unit very public about it as well on the media saying we're part of a blocking unit. Our job is to sit here in the second line with the, uh, with the PKM mm -hmm. and anybody who tries to run away from these drones that Arnie's yeah. like, uh, chasing with, we shoot or we take them captive. That was their job. Very public about it as well. Blocking wow. unit. And Ukraine doesn't have this, right? Obviously. No, yeah. I've never experienced People that. have the urge to fight. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, there's due process with it. Yeah. Not units that are being paid to go and hold the second line to kill your own. That's, it kind of shows you who the good side is. And I'm, I'm surprised that they, they don't see that even being part of a blocking unit. Yeah. yeah. And Ooh. so these guys that you yeah. were close with that joined the Russian side, what, what are their politics? If Yeah, uh, I know that uh, one of them was a very hard communist. Okay. Uh, a young dude, though. Mm -hmm. Okay. So 
I leave room for people to grow up. Um, unfortunately, he's in a he's in a place where if we we're on the battlefield meeting each other, we'd have to kill each other. We, I'm sure we'd be okay with that. But um, he's communist, and then uh, the other one is just very anti-imperialist, but to a point where it's mostly based on NATO like uh, involvement. He's he really buys into the Russian propaganda. Um, so, well, yeah, interesting. It's. I wonder what the process is like. You just fly to Moscow and then you just say, I want to fight. It's like, I Can't guess they'll take you. I mean, they're putting cons they're putting like uh, prisoners yeah, in their war. Or... I have no idea. But yeah. the, the weird thing is like, I know where they're from. Uh, they're public about it as well. So Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder if they can leave Russia now and go to Spain. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't. Mm, I, yeah. I would think not, but maybe. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be kind of crazy to meet them. I feel yeah, like they've went there actually. during this, the last two years as well. Not sure though, but yeah, would they be labeled as a terrorist? Maybe I don't know. I yeah, don't know. it's interesting. Hmm. It's a, Never it's thought a about question. that. Well, yeah, we'll see when the war ends. Uh, what happens? But wouldn't want to meet with them anyway. Yeah, no. but I think you get Russian citizenship pretty easily if you join the military over there. Yeah, I would imagine so. I I think uh, the one who's older, who is very close to, I think he would stay there, mm -hmm. um, make a new life there. Uh, the younger dude though, like he gave up everything. I don't know. Yeah, and he, how old was this young guy? 22, you said, I think? Uh, when he was in the YBS with me, he was 18 years old. 18, wow. 18. So he's Crazy. like 20, 21, something like that. Wow. Crazy. It's like we were talking about this Nick guy, and you were saying like, oh, he's young. Yeah. You know, everyone makes mistakes. Yeah. But this, this is a pretty big mistake for this guy to make. Pretty big mistake. Yeah, um, even if he's young. I, I think, again, this the older dude, he was like a father figure to all of us. Mm -hmm. and I think young dudes who joined... Um, yeah, it, it's very easy to get wrapped up in who your superior agrees with. And yeah, crazy. Yeah. And so right now you're working on drones, right? Yeah. Right now it's FPVs. FPVs. Building FPVs. Yeah. 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 Tell me about this. I remember uh, you, were, you were very excited talking about it yesterday. Yeah. I love so, talking yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about it. Yeah, what kind so, of drones are these? Sorry? What kind of drones are these? So we're doing bomber, bomber FPVs. They're mm -hmm. reusable, cost effective. And we see videos all the time of uh, Mavics dropping bombs, uh, but it can only be a max weight of like 500 grams, like a half kilo, that's max. Um, so the FPV bombers are a fifth of the cost. They can carry five times the weight if you want, <laughs> the mm -hmm. same distance. It's like three, four kilos. And yeah, they're just incredible. Um, so I'm in a territorial defense unit right now and our budgets and territorial defense isn't the greatest. It's not the best. <laughs> uh, but because of the channel that I have and the incredible members that I have and just the supporters, we've been able to do a, from the ground up an FPV cell. And we were able to make it. I'm the engineer. We have another engineer. And we have great pilots as well. Yeah. Uh, so we're making it work, making it work. And I just, yeah, I really, really enjoy making these things. And it's, uh, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, because I remember um, I tried to message you before and you were, I guess you were just so focused on the drones and I messaged trying to get you on the cast for a while now. I remember I told you the story already, Driving. but uh, yeah, I was talking to Ripka. I'm like, are you in touch with um, Sivdiv? Yeah. And she was like, oh yeah, I am, but he's like very busy right now. He has like autism. He's just focusing on his drones. <laughs> very you know, true. He'll get back to you, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's just Super <laughs> true. I, yeah. And that, that's the toughest thing. You know, we were talking about it a little bit yesterday, yeah. but when I get, because I've got like three different avenues I can go. I can, I can go YouTube put effort into that FPV engineering. I can do operations, whatever, but whatever I do, I, I become an autist. I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I need to focus on it with a hundred percent effort and I get so wrapped up into it. Um, so it's, it's been a really hard thing for me to, to balance everything. Mm -hmm. But yeah, right now, the last six months, I've just been very full fledged, wake up, engineer, go to bed. <laughs> are, are you flying the drones too? Or are you just, uh, making them? Um, yeah, I might go on the first, uh, or second rotation, uh, out there when we're testing the bombers and it's final, um like in its final form mm -hmm. uh, but yeah for myself I, i'm a good pilot i'm a good pilot done some bombing runs but uh no i'm gonna leave that to arnie he's uh, <laughs> the best pilot we have uh everybody on my channel knows him he's a uh, great dude yeah remember so, i was i think it was your video i was watching where yeah. you were dropping like a water bottle and yeah, you're like dead yeah. <laughs> i'm dead <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah that was arnie he was flying it uh, okay right on yep. yeah because i remember i was at atlas weekend which is like this music festival here in kiev uh and under like underground, like in the uh, the parking garage, there was uh, a booth where they were teaching people how to put on a tourniquet, and mm -hmm. they had like this um, drone, like flying drone simulator, FPV drone simulator. And so I was trying it out, and it's so difficult the controls. <laughs> I'm like, I thought it was gonna be like a Mavic, cause I have a Mavic. I'm like, yeah, that's easy yeah. to fly. 
And I'm like, dude, it's so difficult. And it's insane. I was watching the guy do it because they had like this uh, course and you have to go through the rings and through the windows. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, he's so good. At it. And I tried, I can't even fly it normally. <laughs> I can't even go up. I'm just crashing to the floor all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, well, there's, there's different forms of flying as well. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, kamikazes, you want an acro mode, which is that sort of mode where it's so difficult. Mm -hmm. But we do have a mode <clears throat> that we put on the bombers called the angle mode, which will automatically uh, level its, um, like its left to right movement and going forward and back. Yeah. So we'll level it, but it'll still be taken away by the wind. You still have to figure out something. So uh, that's usually how we start people off on angle mode, mm -hmm. um, which I'm guessing you didn't do. No, I didn't do, bro. <laughs> so we'll, we'll do angle mode. It's a little bit like a Mavic, and then we'll go on to acro. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And how how would you say like drones have changed the war? Because they're, they're a wow. big part of the war right now. Yeah. I, the biggest thing for me, like the war in general, obviously we all know they're having a huge impact on the battlefield. But the big thing is that I'm really passionate about this too, and I want to make a video about it. Ukraine is doing the right thing compared to what I saw in Syria and Iraq. The Kurds in Iraq and Syria were pretty heavily dependent on Western aid and support. But as soon as, uh, I know in 2019, uh, Rojava got um, invaded again, and it was because the U.S. dropped their support, and then they got invaded and everything. How drones have helped Ukraine is let them be self-dependent. They're able to have their own weapons that are very effective that they can make here and it's cheap. And even if the Western aid drops, they'll always have FPVs and they'll always be able to take out tanks, take out whatever, 20 kilometers deep, even 500 kilometers deep. I mean, they're making their own Polonica uh, mm -hmm. missile drones. That's, uh, that's how I think it, it changed everything. It's self-dependency. They know that if the support drops, it's going to be good. It's going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. No, drones have definitely changed the war. There's like reconnaissance, FPVs, drone drops. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a huge part and they're so cost effective. Like you said, you can take out a tank yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> with a drone. Like how much is a drone? I don't know. I mean, a bomber drone, a kamikaze, could be like as low as 200 bucks if you want. 200 bucks. Yeah. And how much is a tank, would you say? Oh, probably million. two million. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's like, you know, 200 bucks, two million. I feel yeah. like it's a good trade. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's incredible, man. Yeah, yeah. So um, how would you, because I talked to some uh, people that are involved in like flying these drones. Hmm. And I always wonder like how traumatizing this is because you're literally, I know like in yeah. combat sometimes like you're shooting or shooting artillery, you don't really see like a face or something like this. Yeah. With this drone drop, you kind of see it and you maybe disassociate because you're not there in like literally right there in front mm. of the guy. You just see it on the TV. How Very, traumatizing would you say this is, you know? Um, for most of the pilots that I know, uh, as well as myself, not very traumatizing, mm. you know? Um, I, I don't think of it too much at all. Uh, it is very disassociative and I'll be honest about it. It is. Um, it's just a picture on you fly, you know, it's a picture on your screen. It's very disassociating, but I think that's also good. I think it's also good for um, at least the soldiers out there. It's uh, less traumatic and our job is our job. We all know that as soldiers and it makes it a little bit less traumatic. It is, you know, there's questions about morals and the ethics of using drones and stuff but i think we're well beyond that drones are here to say yeah the cat's already out of the bag man it's already out and yeah it's only gonna be going even further you know what i mean so yeah, yeah not so much of an issue no you yeah, know because i've seen like hun dozens if not hundreds of these drone drop videos man yeah. and at first i was like oh wow it's like horrible now i'm just like okay another drone drop video whatever yep and it's kind of like a little sad i think that i'm so desensitized to it yeah yeah, and no, it's a, it's a little worrying. I do keep my eye on that, try and make sure that it's, like, I remember these are human beings, no matter what. Um, but yeah, I'll figure that out after the war is over, you know? Yeah. I think that's all we can do. No yeah. time for grief. There's no time for anything. It's just time for, okay, we got to stop the advance and drone school. You ever done like therapy before? Or? Um, no, um, in the past, yeah, but no, not so much. I think uh, YouTube in a lot of ways uh, mm -hmm. for myself is kind of a therapy. And I think for yourself as well, having this podcast. Yeah. It's like being able to talk things through and uh, yeah, being able to have people see it. Pretty therapeutic for me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you seem pretty like level headed. You have a good sense of humor. We we're hanging out yesterday <laughs> and I really enjoyed talking to you, man. Yeah, and I just kind of imagine like, oh, this guy's like in the military. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Killing back. Coming all shapes yeah. and sizes. You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 No, it, it's crazy, man. But, um, so what would you say about the current state of the war right now? Because you, you probably understand a lot better than, than I do and what's going on. Okay. Um, I would say, again, with the self-dependency, I think that's going to be the, the biggest thing that I'm seeing right now. Um, obviously, the Russians are pushing a little bit in other areas. We also see Ukraine going to Kursk. I think it's still a give and take. It's not so much attrition. It is attritional. 
but it's still very much a give and take, just like we've seen throughout this entire war. Um, so I think the current state of the war is Ukraine is leaning towards self-dependency, making their own missiles, making their own drones. And uh, I, I think that's, that's going to, I think in a couple months, we'll see uh, what the benefit of that is, I suppose. Yeah. And how do you feel about this Kursk incursion? Like, did you yeah. have any idea it was going to happen or are you just surprised like me? I, I think everybody involved was uh, <laughs> a little surprised. Yeah. yeah. No, that was a complete surprise. Insane. Yeah. Yeah, you, I think it's really cool, though. Are yeah. you keeping updates on what's going on in Kursk right now? Because I remember they yeah. blew up a bridge and they're trying to, like, I guess, like, uh, fortify their, I guess, space, their area. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll i tell you what, I am not a strategician. Uh, mm -hmm. I do try and keep up with that stuff. And mm -hmm. I know that they, they went up north from a little bit more west and maybe they'll connect it or maybe that was a diversion to go and let off the pressure from the main uh, curse push not sure yeah. but pretty cool man that was a definite cool. definite uh, morale boost yeah. Uh, yeah yeah because there's a lot of, a lot of bad news coming from the Pokros direction i guess mm. uh and this was uh, definitely a morale boost because i know the west they were talking about maybe doing some negotiations but after they uh they made the incursion into kursk now mm. russia doesn't want to negotiate like on the back foot you know because yeah. obviously if they want curse back, they have to fight for it, which they're trying to do, and they can't. Or they have to give Ukraine something that they have right now, which they don't want to. Yeah. Because in the Russian constitution, Donbass and Crimea is Russian territory mm. in their constitution. So they would have to change their constitution again, saying, you know, okay, now we want Kursk back, so we'll give you Donbass. I don't know. But it, yeah. it's definitely a morale boost. And if Ukraine can hold it, this is like huge. It absolutely is. Yeah. They're, yeah. You can see how the Russians are trying to hide that. And they're, you know, I'll follow some of their Telegram pages or whatever, but they're trying to hide it very, very much so. They're, uh, I think they know the, the relevance of it and the importance of a huge chunk of Russia being taken. It's a, yeah. pretty cool. And I heard like, so they have like these IDPs over there, these internally displaced people in Russia from Kursk that uh, left into Russian territory. And there, I heard that's, I heard, yeah, that they're putting them in, Don, relocating them to Donbass or mm. to Crimea because they don't want to put Whoa. them in different cities like in Russia because then they'll tell their neighbors about what's happening in Kursk. Yeah. And it Look might shift that. the narrative in, in Russia. Look at that. Yeah. And it's crazy. It, you know, it's sad. It's, it's sad for civilians to have to deal with that. It'd be even their, their country is embarrassed by them, embarrassed by the situation that they just sent them out to Ukraine territory that was, that was taken. But man, like you can't, I don't think anybody in Ukraine could say, I'm sorry about that. Like this is, we've been dealing with this for years. Exactly. There's, I don't know one Ukrainian soldier in my unit that doesn't have family that's in occupied territory. They're fighting for their homes and here it is. Here's, here's your taste of it. You know, how do you like it? Yeah. But, um, what's interesting to me, I talked about this like on a previous episode. Um, but yeah, I want to get to like your take on it or share yeah. this with you, see what your take is. So, um, Usually when Russia takes a city, they just basically level it. And then they just take over like the, the rubble. Hmm. But when it's on their territory, like Kursk, like Suja or something, do they have to like level the city in order to get it back? This is not like a winning strategy for them. I don't know. It's like their territory. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm wondering as well. It yeah. seems like it though. You know, I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of strikes that are going into the, their towns and they're like bragging about it on their telegrams. Like here's the FPV strike on a town in Suja. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, okay, dude. Like... <laughs> You're gonna pick up the propellers out of this your own countryman's uh, house. It's kind of weird. Yeah. But. And so uh, I want to ask you. So, say the war ends, hmm. and you know whether it's on Ukraine's terms or Russia's terms or whatever, what are you doing next? I think I would uh, definitely want to stay and help rebuild a bit. You know, I would definitely find some work here uh, to do to go and clean up and do whatever whatever we can. Not sure though. Well, we'll see when it ends. Are, are um, you that connected to Ukraine? Because in you were in uh, Syria, and then you just hopped from Syria to uh, Ukraine. So what if there's like another war going on? You hop into another war, or are you just gonna stay in Ukraine? No, I. There's something about Ukraine. Something about. Really like it. Um, no, I'd stay here. There's still a lot of work that's to be done when the war ends. Um, so I'd be I'd be totally okay doing that in a military capacity, whether it's holding a border or uh, whether it's working with the civilians or infrastructure, fixing stuff. There's a lot of work to be done. What makes Ukraine so special to you then that you decide to stay? Like, what is it? You said it's special or something about it, but what is it? Yeah, I mean, for myself, it's the people, the culture, um, which, okay, it's a broad term, but <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, the people, I've never met more hospitable people than in Ukraine. It, it's incredible. It's not just because I'm American. I, I can tell the way that they talk to each other and everything. Very, very kind. Um, it's it's a little bit more uh, close to home to me as well, uh, as opposed to Iraq, where it's a very different culture. I can learn the language. I can spend some time there, but can't really live there. Wouldn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. 
Ukraine. It's it's uh, exactly what I wanted to, wanted to see in my own country back in Michigan. Yeah. Like just hospitable people care. We're nice. We're doing good work. Everybody's involved. The, the other big thing, everybody knows what the war is like. You know what the war is like, even though you haven't been in the front line. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows what the war is like. Everybody's been through missiles. Everybody's been through trauma, dealing with uh, friends that are they're being killed. They're on the front line. The worry. Everybody knows what it's like. And can't say the same about the U.S. Feel very out of place there. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um, so are you learning Ukrainian at all? No. <laughs> I, I, not, I mean, <laughs> if I was, I'd lie to you. No, no. I, I know a little bit, but they could probably connect you to this language school I'm, um, go, I'm working with. It's uh, uh-huh. called Language Lab, and they do free lessons for foreign volunteers. And Is it online? It's online, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're interested, I know you you hardly have any time, but yeah, if you're interested, I can connect you. I know them pretty well. They can do free lessons for you. That could be good. That yeah, could be good. I'll definitely try to connect you. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, so you've been so when you're on rotation, I guess you spend most of your time in Kiev, right? Uh, like on rotation? Off rotation. Oh, off rotation. Yeah. Or on rotation, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the so term much. is here. <laughs> when you're yeah. not over in the over east. There. Yeah, yeah, over there. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, this is a first trip I've done to Kiev in a while. Um, off rotation, usually I'll just go uh, stick to one of the major towns out east and just kind of chill alone for a bit. Yeah. Edit videos. But um, no, I've, I've been working uh, a lot. I haven't really had time off in a while. Um, they give me the time off, but I... I really just want to get the work done. <laughs> yeah, you said you're probably gonna take a vacation soon too, right? Yeah, I might do it. Yeah. In a month or two, maybe. Where do you I, said go? That, I said that a month or two ago, <laughs> so we'll see. Where do you want to go? I'm not sure yet. Uh, maybe the States, maybe um, out in Asia again. Really like uh, Vietnam, mm-hmm. really like it. The culture, everything, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and I was in we'll Southeast see. Asia once. Uh, I was in Malaysia, Myanmar, and um, Thailand. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's yeah, beautiful. Thailand and Thailand is beautiful, man. It, it's great. Yeah, I've never been to Vietnam, but I heard it's also great. Yeah, it's super cool. The nightlife is cool. You know, it's not just like drinking. It's people like just genuinely having a good time, riding a motorbikes and drinking boba. You know, it's, it's really yeah. fun. Yeah. But, um, oh, by the way, I wanted to mention this because you were talking about this before. I just, uh, yeah, I lost the thoughts. So um, this girl yesterday, the university student. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just explain for like the camera. So um, I might do this lecture at this university here in, oh, here in Ukraine. Yeah. And... When she came out, she we were talking a lot, a lot of nonsense, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, when she came out, she respected you guys so much. She's like, oh my gosh. She kept yeah. saying like, I really respect what you're doing. You're, you're defending my country. And yeah. I know I just feel like, especially a guy like you as a foreigner in Ukraine, you don't have to be here. You're like risking your life. And people here, they do show you a lot of respect, you know? Yeah. And I can feel it through, especially that girl yesterday. She had like this, I respect, I will do whatever you guys like need me to do. Like I can help any way I can. Like she was eager to talk to you guys, understand more about like why you decided to fight. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, you, you probably don't have time for it. Maybe I'll connect her with like someone else. But um, yeah, I think she's interested in having like a, a foreign military person come to the university as well and talk about their mm. experience because she's trying to get more people to volunteer. She's trying to get more people to fundraise on their own, to donate, stuff like this. So uh, yeah, I think it's a really good cause and she's trying to get the younger uh the younger generation kind of more involved in this as well. Uh, I think it's super cool. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah no, I, I'd love if uh, Troy did it. I, I know that'd be an awesome one. Yeah. Um, if I find some time, maybe. But oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's super cool that, uh, that people are doing that, especially the younger generation. You know, we yeah, see yeah. a lot of, at least in my unit, a lot of older people, I think a lot, all across the front line. A lot of people are, they had their kids, they had their family. They're on the front line now. Yeah. So it's cool to see the younger people keeping up with it. Oh, totally, man. Yeah. And um, I believe conscription is like 25, right? Oh, maybe. Yeah, yeah. 25, yeah, okay. I think so. Yeah. Do you think that that is a nice age or do you think they should lower it or? Yeah, I'm not sure. Hmm. You know, I'm sure it has to do with numbers and, you know, who they can pull at certain ages and stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it has to be a thing. This is, you're defending your homeland. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Everyone has like their opinion on this. But how do you feel as someone who is currently fighting in the war when you see people of military age just walk around the city, hanging out, living a normal life? It's okay. It's okay. You know, I, I know I was doing that the last week. Have mm-hmm. some time off, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know everybody. I try not to, not to judge. I don't know what their background is. It could be they're the only son left. You know, it could be, it could be anything. I'm okay with it as long as people don't forget. You know, you got to be respectful towards it and... Just always have in your mind that, you know, this is, you have the freedom because, you know, there's people out there going to the zero line, you know, holding the line. And as long as you remember that, 
I'm okay with the Ukrainians being Ukrainians. Like, just love it. Yeah, because I know some people that are very critical. They see the they're military people. They see like these young guys walking around. They're like, why isn't he like in the war? Yeah. Like, yeah, something like this. But it's really good that you have like this outlook, you know, because people you don't know their story. Yeah, people are different, you know. Yeah, yeah. So almost Ukraine has a need for all sorts of different people right now. They they need people who are everything. Yeah, yeah. it's okay to be something other than a soldier. Absolutely. Yeah, and um, how do you? I know you're not a strategist strategist yeah <laughs> strategist <laughs> <laughs> oh my brain's not working today man <laughs> long night but um yeah so how do you think the war will end i'm not sure oh that's yeah it's a big question um one thing i will say is i'm okay with anything that the ukrainian people want and that's exactly what Zelensky said i think uh, a couple months ago i saw on instagram i'm okay with anything you know i'm a foreigner i'm gonna help when the ukrainians want to fight and just like Zelensky said, if the majority of the population wants us to do negotiations and sacrifice this or that, we could talk about it. But right now, the Ukrainian people are behind the war, behind our effort to regain the territory that, that they deserve. And I'll be here to see it, whatever way it goes. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, yeah, I was reading the comments. So it was like on this like Nick video, because uh, it's fairly recent, that's why I'm talking about it. But there was a comment saying, uh, because he interviewed people on the streets. And uh, he, in the interviews, he was asking, um, do you think that, who do you want to win uh, as, for like the presidency, Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris, or uh, Donald Trump? Mm. And everyone was saying like, Kamala Harris. And some right wing person commented like, oh, I can't believe they want the war to keep going on. The Ukrainian person said, yeah, we want to keep going on. We want our land back. Yeah. Yeah. And this is not the point that the commenter was trying to make, you know? Yeah. But yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, the elections. It's a tough thing, you know, we don't have to talk about politics right now, but I do want to mention one thing. Like, I grew up in a conservative household, okay? I would consider myself in the middle. You know, I've grown up and you know, my ideas expanded, but it's very difficult for me to vote on one side because of just the foreign policy. You know, it, it hasn't just been Ukraine that the side that maybe traditionally, if I was younger and still in the States, maybe I'd vote for. Mm. It's not just Ukraine, it's also Syria, it's also Iraq. Like the whole, bat, the track record of all the wars that I've been a part of, it, it's it's tough to it's tough to find somebody that I like domestically mm. that has a good foreign policy that I would that would go behind. It's very difficult for me. Not yeah. totally, man. And yeah, I'm kind of over American politics, man. Every yeah, four I years, I get like, oh, not this again, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially with Donald Trump making comebacks, I feel like he's gonna live forever, man. <laughs> you know, and just Maybe. bother, yeah, bother the U.S. and me. Yeah, but um. Okay, so we're reaching like the end of our time. Is there something that you want to talk about that is important to you that we missed or we didn't discuss? Um, I guess I just shout out my team. Uh, 130th Territorial Defense. <laughs> uh, great group of dudes. Been working at Chassis VR for, for like eight months now. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'll say as well, like I started off doing rotations, um, going to the front, doing air recon, did some good work. Great group of, uh, great group of guys, but... Um, they're amazing. They let me, after my third operation, I was like, hey, I'd like to focus on FPVs, get that up for you guys. It's been a, a dream of ours. And they sent me to training. They sent me everything that I would need, help. And here we are today, and we're about to do our first full rotation of FPVs. And it's because of everybody, the entire community. I want to shout out my community as well. Like It's it's really, really cool. Like I, Sometimes I don't feel like I deserve it, which is why I try and work as best I can. Um, but it's just incredible seeing everybody work together and help. Doves of Freedom, incredible dude. He's a zero liner. He's been here since the start of the war, international, uh, a month ago. He gets injured pretty bad, wounded on the front line. And I visit him in the, in the hospital and he's working on FPVs. He's wow. working on uh, being a zero liner. He's, uh, he's starting this fundraising NGO called Doves of Freedom and he's trying to expand it. He doesn't even fly FPVs. This is how like involved people are, and I've, I'm very uh, humbled by everybody that I meet here. Seriously, everybody that I meet, there's incredible people out there. So that's what I want to say. All right, and you mentioned Chess of Yar. Any updates from Chess of Yar? What's the news like? What's it look like? Yeah, um, it's a little bit more stagnant than a uh, cross direction, mm -hmm. um, you know, southeast Ukraine. But yeah, I mean, we're holding the line best we can, and I'll tell you what, like being air recon. You know, that was most of my job when I was doing rotations out there. Just watch them, calling in artillery. Uh, the Russians are losing a lot of dudes pushing for the ground that they're that they're gaining. And there's a lot of give and take still. Uh, Chess VR is not falling yet. We're holding the line the best we can. Uh, and they're Russians are throwing everything. And they're they're losing a lot. 
Mm-hmm. And a- I'm editing up uh, some more combat footage from my second operation, third operation. People see that very much so. It's uh, we're doing the best we can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like another Bakhmut situation, right? We're just throwing like meat wave after meat wave. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty much it. It's really brutal. I mean, I, I hate to be on the receiving end of <laughs> what's mm-hmm. coming at them. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I want to ask you one more question. Um, oh, man, I just had it. Last Tim night Hortons? kills me, man. Tim Hortons. Yeah, Tim Hortons, yeah, so, uh, Tim Hortons or Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> no. But uh, yeah, I guess that's it. So uh, what, what I like to do at the end, um, mm-hmm. maybe you can you know plug your uh, NGO or whatever organization you want, cool. or your, your brigade. You can look in the camera or just yeah. shout out to anyone that you want. And after that, I'll do like the closing. Cool. Yeah. Shout out to the Civ Div community. Love you guys, the members. Uh, Treyon, Caitlin, uh, AAA, tons of people. Wish I could remember all the names. And shout out to Doves of Freedom, the dude, you're a legend. And yeah, I already did most of the plug before this. But, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. but uh, yeah, I know what I was going to remember <laughs> what I was going to say right now. So congrats on getting your a million subscribers Thanks, on man. YouTube. All right. And you're not getting a play button, though. I think we talked nope. about these yesterday. Yeah, YouTube doesn't want me to get one. No play button, man. No, Damn it. Did you get one before? Because you get one after certain milestones, right? Yeah, yeah. I got the 100,000. I gave that to Arnie um, mm-hmm. as a gift. So I don't have a play button anymore. It's okay. No. It's okay. You'll get one, man. I'll talk to YouTube. YouTube, if you're watching, he needs a please, play button. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I'm going to do for the sure. closing. And then, yeah. So uh, thanks again for tuning in to this episode of Expats in Ukraine with your host, me, Corey. It was great having you on today, Rody. You're an amazing guy. I hope to have uh, more chats with you after the cast. Absolutely. <laughs> well, come up here, man. Let's shake hands. Awesome. Thanks so much. I appreciate it.